My name is Tim Jenkins, and I'm the Digital Media Minister, and it is great to be with you this morning. We're going to be talking about our Old Testament reading, 1 Samuel. And so, uh, as, as Father Andrew said, our, our children's sermon series is going to be talking about the life of David. And David, of course, is King David um, in his, his story of the Bible. But, you, you know, before you can get a King David, you have to, of course, have the kings of Israel. And that's what our lesson was about this morning. And since, you know, that children's sermon is probably like the best <laughs> way to hear that story, I'll jump into the context of that scripture uh, and talk a little bit about who the people of Israel were. The Israelites were peculiar people. They uh, worshipped an invisible God. He was uh, not made of stone or gold like the gods of the other nations. He was uh, invisible. You couldn't see him. You didn't know what he looked like, but he revealed himself to them through burning bushes and pillars of fire, and uh, he made a covenant with Abraham through them, which is where Israelites go all the way back to, saying that if they worshipped him and they obeyed his commandments, he would provide for them, protect them, bless them, and lead them into a promised land. And that's exactly what he did. The Israelites were peculiar in that they were a tribal people. They had no centralized leadership, no kings. They had, you know, religious leaders like Moses or Aaron, but when it came to fending off external or internal threats, the system that God used was judges. There's a book in the Bible called Judges. It's about those people, the people that God raised up. You might have heard some of them before. Samson, you know, like the long hair, very beefy, very strong, again, like me. Uh, <laughs> people like Gideon, Samuel is a judge, Deborah is a judge. There's a whole series of them. This is one of my favorite books when I was a kid. Uh, I thought I had stumbled across like a secret R-rated like version of the Bible. There's like assassins, battles, and people. It's awesome. Anyway, it's a really good section of it, but this is what God did. He would raise these people to come and to um, deal with the issues that plagued Israel, the threats. Now, there's this phrase that we see in the book of Judges, which is, uh, at that time there was no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. This is kind of like a polite way of discussing the cycle of the Israelites where they would worship God in a kind of Jesus take the wheel type moment when something was bad. And then when things were good, they would kind of, you know, fade away and do their own thing. What was right in their own eyes, which would often get them in, into trouble and they would need God. So during this time, uh, the idea, the peculiarity was again that they had no king because God was their king, right? This is why when the elders come to Samuel and they say to him, we want a king, God sees this as a rejection of him. This is kind of an important point in the life of Israel that the people are rejecting God, but in what way are they doing that? I believe that this is demonstrating the problem the Israelites have in trusting God. God. In spite of the fact of the covenant and the miracles, they had a trust issue. Now, the trust issue looks at face value like they weren't trustful that God would protect them. The excuse that they give, and I call it an excuse, is they say, we need a king who will go and fight and have an army for us. And yes, he'll take some of our crops and on sons and daughters and our slaves, and he'll take these things from us, but we can see him, and he'll have an army, and he'll go and fight these things. That's kind of like describing the mistrust I have of, like, Apple Maps. I don't know if you've ever used the map program that is uh, Apple developed for their platform iOS on the iPhone. When it first came out, it had a notorious problem, which is that it would not deliver you always to your destination. This is a significant and critical flaw of a map program. <laughs> I remember once a buddy and I thought we were going to uh, get Indian food, and we pulled into a neighborhood, and I thought to myself, 
Either Apple Maps has a very strong sense about what people are having for dinner today, or I have been brought to the wrong destination. I don't use Apple Maps because of that experience, because like some others, I'm sure they fixed it. I don't know. That's all well and good, but I don't trust it to get me to my destination. This kind of looks like what the elders of Israel are saying when they say they want a king who will wage war for them, that they don't trust that God is going to protect them. Now, I call this an excuse because, number one, they have like this history of protection, of God raising up judges, like I mentioned Gideon, who would go and defeat the external threats of Israel. I think the real thing here is that what the elders mean when they say they want a king is that they want a guy who, no matter what, will always be motivated to protect his kingdom. You see, like a king has a vested interest in maintaining his kingship, right? It doesn't matter what the spiritual health of his kingdom is, he still wants to be king. It's way better to be king than not to be king, right? And so the Israelites want a king because it means that they can ignore the inconvenient parts of God's commandments. Remember, the covenant situation is they worship God and they obey his commandments and God protects them and blesses them. So a king, the trust issue here is not that they don't trust God will protect them, but that they don't trust that what God says is the best way to live is really worth it. That's a significant trust issue. When I think about that situation, I think about, you know, what's a good metaphor? This is what I've been asking myself. And it would be like a couple, like a marriage, where the spouse has like a secret bank account, right? Where they funnel a little bit of money off. I think the, the thing you might learn, you would look, you, when you, the thing you might think when you would learn about that situation is you would say, it feels like that spouse is kind of living one foot out the door. They don't trust. So, what does it mean to trust God? You know, when I was younger, when I was 24 years old, I decided I was going to become a missionary. I was going to go to a country called Guatemala, which is just south of Mexico. And I was going to go work with kids and plant churches. And, you know, Guatemala, it's a rough place. It's, uh, it's dangerous. And and it was okay, though, because I was going to trust that God was going to see me through no matter what. And even if I died, it would be okay because I'd be following God's call on my life. When I was 24 years old, I might have described what it meant to trust God in those terms. Those terms also look remarkably similar to the way that a 24-year-old might think themselves invincible, right? At 24, I was pretty confident I could face anything. I did have like a glass of milk from Guatemala that gave me just like a real bad week, but <laughs> I thought I could face anything. But the truth of it is that trust in God is not just outward action. I mean, it is outward action. That is important. You know, James says faith without works is dead. But Jesus talked a lot about our inward condition as well. You know, we are called to be peculiar people as well. We still worship the same invisible God, although he's grown even more perplexing and complex in the Trinity. He's also came in the incarnation and was sacrificed on the cross. But the same idea is there. The same questions that people have been wrestling with there, which is to say, is all of this worth it? Right? Because when we think about the cross, the thing that we know is to get all of Jesus, we have to give all of ourselves. You know, when the people of Israel wanted a king, the thing that they were doing is they were trying to find a way to carve out a little bit of their selves to hold back. Some autonomy, to be able to do what they want in the places where they wanted to. So what are you holding back? This is the question I have to ask myself frequently. 
When I think about that 24-year-old who was so willing to fly to a foreign country where he didn't even really speak the language, the thing I know about that 24-year-old is he struggled with the same things that I struggle with, which is giving myself over completely to God. There are always parts of myself that I want to hold back. I'm now older. I mean, only a little bit older, but (laughs) I have a wife and I have kids now, and there's parts of me that worry about things like money and want to be able to provide for them. And there are things in my life that I I don't want to give over to the Lord because I know that it won't be maybe as fun in my mind as it is now. And the question that that comes down to is then is, do I really believe that the things that God says are good, are worth it? Not just in the eternal, not just that like giving all of me to, to receive all of Jesus means I get to go to heaven, but that like it also means that this life will be better too. I think this is a thing that we all struggle with. And I can't really point out to you what internally you struggle with to give over to God, but I think that if you spent some time honestly looking in, you might discover there are some trust issues. And so as I close this sermon today, I want to challenge you to do that. It's hard because it's really easy to say like, well, all right, well, I don't trust God in this place. Check, I'm done. But that's only the first step. You have to take it to its full conclusion. As followers of Christ, to trust God means to every day examine the places in our hearts where we're holding something back and give that over to God. We have to give all of us for all of him every day and live with that sacrifice, our self-sacrifice, and the belief that it's worth it. It's worth it tomorrow, but also worth it today.